I'm talking to Paul Cockshot today. I'm just going to read his bio from a book, uh, How the World Works, which I'm reading at the moment, which is very good. It's, um, Paul Cockshot is a computer engineer working on computer design and teaching computer science at universities in Scotland. Named on 52 patents, his research covers robotics, computer parallelism, 3D TV, foundations, comp computability, and data compression. His books include Towards the New Socialism, Classical Econophysics, and Computation and Its Limits. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about the book Towards the New Socialism, written by Paul Cockshot and Alan Cottrell, published in 1993. Uh, there, the authors present a bold vision of a democratically planned economy using computerized labor time. In this interview, we'll be discussing some more advanced questions about that model. So I recommend that you read the book to really understand what we're talking about. You can also watch some excellent videos on Dr. Kotschott's um, YouTube channel. You can find a link to that and his website in the description below. Just seeing if oh. I had a copy of the book, but I don't seem to have one. Oh, I uh, can't wave one around here. I, I have one actually. Uh, <laughs> Do I? Yeah, I have one here, so it's all right. Look, there it is. Um, so, uh, Dr. Paul Cockshot, thank you very much for joining me. So, we'll begin with the first question, um, a more general one. So, some advocates of market socialism say that, quote, central planning is a solution looking for a problem, end quote. Um, how would you answer in response to an advocate of the most sophisticated and radical kinds of market socialism? Critic might say something like, well, yes, there can be direct straight pro state provision of all necessities and control of key sectors. But once working class incomes are substantially increased due to worker self-management of, of firms, suppression of rentiers, uh, plus state regulation, regulation of the market, uh, a job guarantee and so forth, there's no need to have a society which uses central computerized uh, planning and labor time. How would you respond to that? Well, my feeling is that whilst a Yugoslav type system would be a considerable advance for most people, um, the Yugoslav economy, which is the historical example we've got of such a model, had a series of contradictions which developed over time. One of them was that because it is a market system, the market does not regulate total demand for labor to be equal to the number of people wanting to work. And the, there was an unemployment problem in Yugoslavia because of that. In a way, there wasn't there was never an unemployment problem in the Soviet Union, for example. And the solution to it during the 1960s and 70s was emigration to Germany. So uh, it, it can't be said to have really solved the problem of providing full employment for everyone. Now, The second point is that over time, you also got the buildup of increased, increasing regional disparities. These regional disparities became so intense that the conflicts associated with them eventually led to the breakup of the state. And the, the problem is that market economies tend to lead to uneven development, geographically uneven development. And that the state can survive if it's a strong centralized state that holds the country together um, and is not threatened. But it, it certainly pro proved to be a, a critical failure. In the, in the Yugoslav example. More generally, if you say there's going to be a job guarantee, what does that job guarantee mean? What is the, how is the job guarantee going to be met? Is it going to be met by the state expanding employment in, in state industries? In which case, you have the progressive replacement of a cooperative sector with a state sector. The next issue is 
how do you how does such a market socialist system adapt to externally imposed imperatives now in historically the externally imposed imperatives have been to industrialize as rapidly as possible for example but at the moment the externally imposed imperatives are to transform the whole economy within a very short time from one based on fossil fuels to one based on non-fossil fuels now that is an in-kind constraint it's a physical constraint it's not a constraint that is readily addressed by market means when any attempt to address it by market means is an indirect dressing up of state planning via market incentives the state plans to do something and has rather inefficiently to try and create a set of market incentives which realize the plan now we know that for the last couple of decades states have formally being agree been agreeing to reduce carbon output and they've been attempt following the neoliberal doctrine that everything has got to be done by market incentives the attempts have been made to do this by market incentives and in general the performance has not been good hmm. okay so there's <clears throat> something a, a bit different it's it's diving into the details of the uh towards the new socialism model i'm just going to i'm just going to refer to the model itself as towards yeah, the yeah. new socialism mm -hmm. so a point that you uh, deal with is uh, self-employment but i'd like to just uh, drill into that a little bit more so my question is really how do various kinds of self-employed people um obtain national labor tokens for their work so let's give a few examples so um today um you might have a chess grandmaster who um gives lessons on the internet via youtube and streaming via twitch and they can uh make money from youtube advertising revenue from uh, subscribers on on twitch uh, patreon and so forth and that's how they make their income uh, you might have a guitar teacher um who does face-to-face -face lessons and they get paid you know 20 euro an hour or something cash in hand or uh you know you might have a meditation teacher who teaches for free and asks for donations or musicians who who play um or uh, I'm, just, I'm just throwing out a, a few things to motivate the, the question. Well, uh, let's take the ch case of uh, uh, the chess master. Okay. The first thing you have to ask is, should chess be a profession or a hobby? Can people, the, the great majority of people who play chess don't do it to make a living. They have a regular job and they play chess as well. And there's nothing to stop a chess grandmaster having a job as a maths teacher or something like that it doesn't it doesn't require full-time activity being good at chess um okay well okay i i, I take a point so let, let's leave that aside and I'll move on to something which is maybe a bit less clear so uh, I, I, an example i think would be the author of a book or yes or a musician who uh, creates a record so you know if, if a musician obviously most musicians who create records are not they successful enough to live off that but let's, let's take a book author so um I, I as far as i know most authors are actually solicited by a publishing company and i think in that case it's it's more simple you could probably arrange some kind of nominal yearly labor time salary on that basis but for a significant proportion of authors who who aren't solicited in advance to write a book it seems uh i i, I yeah so how 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 could um their work be quantified and how could they well, be paid? if someone is actually fully employed writing books okay they spend all their time writing 
then the the Soviet system was you'd become a member of the Writers Guild, and you would be a salaried member of the Writers Guild. So the writers collectively, as an organize as a collective, organize themselves in such a way that they support one another out of out of an allocation the state gives for uh, books. Problem is yeah. that in a in a, a capitalist system, the whole sis, the the whole of it dep- This kind of activity depends on copyright and yeah. people not being allowed to copy things. Yeah, and that was actually uh, the next question. Yeah, it, it, effectively to establish a monopoly, an artificial monopoly. Now, there's no reason why a social society should establish an artificial monopoly like that. And, and, and publications can be put on the web and downloaded for free. Uh, the, 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 it doesn't cost any labor to download something, or a, a minimal amount, tiny, tiny amount of labor to download something. Uh, so the, the, the issue is how are people to be supported when they're writing things? Now, if you, there's masses of people who write and create material on the internet for, just for the joy of doing it. They don't need to be paid to do it. If people are working actually as journalists and systematically allocating so much time to it that it's their full-time activity, then they should be a salaried journalist. And, okay, and so would you say it would be a similar thing for uh, musicians that there would be some kind of musician yeah, skills? That's a salaried musician. You 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 can be employed in a municipal orchestra, a municipal band, municipal um, folk groups, supported by your locality. The I mean, the Soviet Union had a vast number of orchestras compared to a capitalist country and had lots of concert halls because the the local governments employed lots of musicians. Uh, Yeah, so the next question, the question was actually, uh, what regime of intellectual property do you think is appropriate for, well, it says consumer goods, but not actually just consumer goods, uh, such as film, software, et cetera, given that they can be reproduced at near zero marginal cost. I think they should be available to free. Yeah. And just pay people for the labor that went into it. Yeah. And yeah. there shouldn't be any adverts on the video cha- streaming video channels. The streaming video channels should be paid for out of uh, a tax revenue to support the, the computer equipment that's required for them. Well, you're speaking of journalism. So the, uh, the next question is about media independence. So uh, since all resources are owned by the state, and only the state issues national labor tokens. This means that any media organization, say a national or city newspaper, will require permission for access to resources such as printing presses, distribution, and for the labor of the journalists, etc., to acquire labor tokens. Uh, So firstly, is this correct? And if so, how can a boisterous independent media organization be established, survive, and thrive without worrying that if it doesn't tow the line, it will lose access to necessary resources or funding? Well, again, you've got to realize that now a large part of um, media commentary is generated for free by people producing it on on blogs and on social media. But if we we leave that aside, the issue is what are the... um, what is the editorial independence provision that is, is, is set up for printing organizations? Um, the obvious way to do it would be have the editors elected by the, the, the journalists and print workers, if it's still a print mode, uh, in, in that organization. And have some guarantee of, of, editorial independence. We know that some degree of editorial independence is achievable in state uh, organizations in that 
even in capitalist countries, things like the BBC are not totally under state control. Uh, they, they do permit criticism of, of government activity, even though it's a state-funded organization, similarly with Channel 4 in Britain. Um, so yeah, the fact that things are state-funded doesn't mean that they, they'll have less in editorial independence. I mean, that does the editorial independence of the editor of the Sun exceed that of uh, the news editor of the BBC? Well, no. Um, let me say for the sake of argument, um, let's compare towards new socialism with a, a, a hypothetical market socialist system. Yeah. Obviously, it depends which, because it's easier to criticise you know, the capitalist system. Um, so let's just say, for the sake of argument, somebody might say, that in a market socialist system, even if a newspaper presented a very controversial opinion which ruffled the feathers of the majority of residents, it could materially sustain itself if enough people purchased the newspaper. This would not but require... newspapers aren't supported by purchase. They're supported by advertising. So, And that's completely the case, overwhelmingly the case with TV channels. So how, if you're going to have a market socialist system of media, you are assuming that you've got essentially competing monopolies or not set oligopolies that are paying for adverts. So you're, you're making all sorts of assumptions about the degree of concentration of economic power, the, um, the fact that advertising is seen as something desirable to have in such a society, etc. Yeah, no, that's that's a fair point. You know, um, that I think a proponent of Marxist socialism would have to answer is how how would the media be funded um, without advertising, which is obviously a very corrupting factor. Um, so just, just so um, I understand you clearly, you're saying that um, there be a certain media organisation and that the uh, the editors or the editorial uh, governance of that group would be determined by. Uh, the actual journalists and workers within that organization. Is that what you're saying or you're making a point? Yeah, I mean, that was how Le Monde used to operate. Um, okay, well, can I ask you then, but how would that address the issue of of, of having access to the, the resources of themselves? So that, that, I think that would definitely be a better, a better structure uh, within within the uh, the media enterprise. But in terms of the relation between the media enterprise and the rest of society and having well, access to resources? the if the major form of you, you see, if you're still thinking in terms of newspapers um, and the, the the newspapers are being paid for in the sense that the paying for the newspapers is the deduction from the the overall labor budget of society to 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 balance the resources used to um, produce a newspaper and you you would charge for the newspaper the number of hours that, sorry, if you charge for the entire print run of the newspaper, the number of hours worked that went into producing that entire print run. Um, so that that's just like any other good. There's nothing special about newspapers as, as opposed to lengths of fabric. If you're talking about broadcasting, where there's not a, a, trend, a purchase of a physical product, then you, it has to be paid for out of some general taxation. Yeah, I, I suppose what I'm, I, what I'm more concerned with, I, I, don't, I don't think it's, it's uh, difficult to see how it could be uh, funded, so to speak, materially. I think that's relatively clear. I suppose more what I'm saying is, the, the issue of, okay, for example, um, you know, people commenting, you know, people can comment on the internet and so forth, but, you know, the most important role that journalists play is in uh, investigative journalism, you know, yeah. and sometimes that can go against the grain of society, it can go against the grain of, of um, powerful figures within society. And I suppose I'm just raising the issue of um, there being a temptation by either the, the public or certain figures within the civil service are trying to use their political uh, power, even if they're an ordinary citizen, to just get rid of 
um, media organizations that they don't agree with. Um, and obviously... Well, we see that with yeah. Julian Assange at the moment. Wait, what do you mean? Well, that that's a media... WikiLeaks is a media organization that the British and American state don't agree with. So yeah. they yeah. respond oh, yeah. to yeah. it yeah. by putting the guy in prison. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, so I, I think, you know, the media is so, is so central um, to any functioning society, particularly to any democracy, that... I think it, it is reasonable to have concerns that um, given that the establishment and maintenance of these media organizations will be a political process um, rather than a purely economic one, that um, there might be issues about that political process being used to, to diminish the independence of media. There is always a, a risk that the state in a society made decide to restrict the media. That Whether the state in a society restricts the media is something quite orthogonal to whether the economy is planned or market-based. Um, There's a whole art. series of means by which the, the media can be um, controlled in uh, Britain. I mean, it, it, let, let's take the Assange case again. Assange revealed that U.S. forces had been killing civilians in Iraq. He also revealed lots of details of communications that had been made by the, the U.S. forces. Now, this was initially published by The Guardian and a number of other newspapers across the world. They took his re investigative reporting. He's an independent investigative reporter who did the work on the web, and the newspapers published it. The intelligence services later turned up at the offices of the Guardian and demanded that they handed over the, all the disks with this and destroyed the disks in the Guardian offices with hammers. Um, since which point, the Guardian has been loyally take, following the line of the intelligence services, um, spreading calumny about Assange and uh, parroting every story that the MI6 want to propagate. So you, you have a nominally independent newspaper which claims that it has no millionaire owners and is independent, but it is effectively a mouthpiece for the secret services. And that's, it's not planned. It's not, it's not legally the case that uh, it has to do that, but the, the secret service are able to impose that. Oh yeah, no, look, I, I completely agree. I mean, to, to suggest that the only circumstances under which uh, media can be um, distorted and controlled by the powerful is under a planned economy uh, would be r ridiculous because it's manifestly not true. I suppose it's more of a matter of degree in that if media organizations are entirely dependent upon the state for resources, that might um, present certain unique... It might not either, but it might present certain it, unique challenges. It depends challenges. on the actual... degree to which you can have a legislative framework which gives effective independent editorial independence to media organizations. It doesn't depend on whether they're state-owned or not. It's a, it's, it's a separate question. It's a, the question is whether or not the state it actually has the effective power or the laws by which it can impose its will on the press. Yeah, no, it's, that's a fair point. If you have a democratic society where, which, which towards a new socialism very much would be, be much more democratic than the societies that we live in. The thing about democracy is that um, it's an expression of what people want. So if people want to live in a society with a free and independent media, then, and that's something that a lot of people are willing to fight for, that's something which is more likely to happen. Yeah. So I think, I think it's, that's, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it doesn't depend at all, as far as I can see, on on the who owns the press. Okay, going on to something quite different now. 
So <clears throat> on page 134 of uh, the book, you say that um, for enterprises produ- uh, producing consumer goods, this should deter the overstatement of input requirements since overstatement would result in a higher labor value and hence a lower ratio of market price to value compared to the correct statement of input requirements. So that's saying that firms um, which are being inefficient essentially with resources could be detected uh, through the ratio of... Yeah, the, yeah, for the same reason, the same mechanism operates now. That if if they uh, employ well overstate the the labor requirements, the equivalent would be deliberately hire more people and run at a higher cost than otherwise, and therefore their goods sell at a higher price. Yes, exactly. So uh, let me ask a follow up on that. So this is true, but it assumes that an appropriately accurate figure for labor value is available with which to make the comparison. So my question is, where does this come from? Uh, is it not possible that the firm, one, systematically overstates input requirements and two, provides an excessively high figure for the required labor value to the planning bureau so that a comparison is not possible? The, the, the difficulty is when you have a single supplier, okay, and where, where the it is some activity which is, highly concentrated so that there is only one enterprise or maybe two enterprises in the country doing it, at which point it's difficult to arrive at uh, an optimal figure for, for, for the average amount of labor required to do it, since the average just is the amount used there. Um, and you then have to say, this is basically, but on the one level, it's an engineering issue. How, how, is, how is the, let's take the, um, something which was concentrated like that, which is the Soviet space program, okay? There was initially just one um, project developing launchers. Now, were they developing the launchers with the minimum resources required? Very difficult to say, since no one else had ever built built a, a rocket to put someone in orbit. Um, once they'd done that, they could, they're able to turn out proton rockets at very low cost. But how do you know it's low cost? It's, an, it's a matter of engineering studies to compare hypothetically what it would require to put things in orbit via a proton rocket versus an Energia or some other design of rocket. It's, it's whether the, if, if, if you're dealing with an industry that is so concentrated that there is only one producer in it, then you it's inevitable that for one thing you take risks okay if you've only got one shot at it your your design for the the moon rocket if it's a wrong design it blows up on the launch pad as it did well that's the risk you take you can't afford to assign three separate teams to build independent moon rockets uh, and you, you, your success depends on whether the engineers are good. Can I follow up on that actually with a slightly different example? Let's say the company is Democratic Communist Fender uh, guitars, making electric guitars. Yeah. And Fender states that a player Stratocaster has a labor value of 100 hours. Well, it's basically the same question. How can the planning bureau determine whether this labor value is itself accurate? No, no, it's, it's, it's the same issue. Well, it's I, unlikely that there's just one factory producing guitars in the whole whole country. So one, as soon as you have multiple people doing it, you have comparisons. Um, the problem is when the comparisons are not exact. Yeah, exactly, uh, exactly, yeah. And that happens in big industries. It happens in 
things like the aircraft industry. The Soviet Union could afford to have Mikoyan, Tupolev, and who was the other one? Illusion design bureaus uh, producing things. So they could have some kind of comparison, or in Yakolev as well, they could have some kind of comparison for jet transports. They might have a couple of different designs to compare. But talking about this in terms of um, overestimating and underestimating the amount of labor is not necessarily a sensible way to look at it. The, the thing is, is the whole engineering design of a particular type of aircraft efficient given the available labor resources, the fuel it's going to use, etc.? Um, and and these are when, the, the, the difficult problems are when you're dealing with very big major industries with very big um, investment costs. And there are pros and cons of having multiple designs and multiple teams. The, the supposed pro of having multiple teams is that they're competing against one another and you make the best choice. Now, that was the attitude taken by the state-owned Atomic Energy Authority in Britain, or sorry, the Central Electricity Generating Board in Britain. It was decided that instead of having the state-owned Atomic Energy Authority design and build all the power stations, they would nuclear stations, they would build the first two after which they would have competing engineering consortia would come up with designs. Now, that actually allowed, they very rapidly progressed, but the problem was that no two were built to the same standard. And you then didn't get the savings which come from replication. Now, if you compare that with the, the French planning system, Electricity de France does the whole thing doesn't put it out to a set of private contractors. So it ends up with standardized designs, which it mass produce and becomes the world leader in nuclear power. So it, the, the, the centralization and having a single organization doing the whole thing seemed to work in the French case. Yeah, well, we, we have to remember there's always pros and cons to any system. Um, it's, it's more of a question of what works in that situation, and what are our tolerances for, for error? Um, yeah. Because there's I mean, always if going they to be had, If the French be, had made a, a fundamentally bad design decision, okay, if they'd made the bad design decision that was involved with the RMBK reactors used at Chernobyl, then you'd have led into a, into a dead end with that. And you have to then switch to an entirely different way of doing things, as the as the as the Russians had to do after that after Chernobyl. So it, th there's no getting round the fact that developing new technologies is a difficult engineering process, and that mistakes are made even by the best engineers designing things. Towards any socialism is a cashless society. Um, people pay for all of their purchases using labor credit cards, essentially. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so is it possible to anonymize transactions so that people have complete privacy over their individual purchases while still allowing the planning bureau to gather vital information on what goods and services are purchased at what time and place? Well, it's obviously certainly, certainly possible. You 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 just don't allow um, the publication or the transmission of the data beyond the the record of initial purchase. It, whether that is always the thing you want to do, um, I mean, there's there's reasons why you may not in a monetary system you may not want banking or Auto, complete banking autonomy because of all the black market and uh, hot money and things that that occurs if if you allow that 
if you're not allowing transfers between people, then there's no particular reason why you couldn't have it completely um, anonymized. But that's a matter for for the the, the, the you know the the equivalent of the what is it GPRS, the General Data Pr- Protection Regulation. Yeah, as in it's something that it, it, te- technically it could be done. So it's just a matter of. Of doing it. It, 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 it's a matter of what data protection regu- legislation the country has. It could be done. So that's really the yeah. main answer to that. Yeah. Um, so you might think this is a bit of a funny question, but um, I suppose the way I approach this is that I tend to approach everything from a kind of engineering point of view. And so that's what motivates this question. So it's about weaknesses. So it's asking, what are the biggest weaknesses uh, from your perspective of towards any socialism? What are the parts? which you think are most deserving of criticism and what parts need to be improved the most? Um, Hold on. What's not worked out explicitly enough is the relationship between election of representatives in a socialist, socialist workplace. And it's necessary subordination to social requirements how is that negotiated I and mean, that 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 is inevitably an element of contradiction there because the decisions by individual representatives may not um Sorry, if decisions were made just by individual representatives on what's going to be done, you've got no guarantee that it'll it'll meet social requirements. But how do you um, allow internal autonomy whilst meeting the external requirements? What is the the kind of legal framework where you would have for that? And some other things which I don't think we explained well enough are maybe we did have it's such a while since i wrote the book that i forget but the the difference between people being paid by an enterprise and people being paid by society as a whole and how does the the budgeting of uh, an enterprise work at that level, I, I mean, we go into it in in some detail, but we, I think, I've later had to elaborate on that. You have elaborated on that in in papers and things. In papers and videos, yes. Yeah. Okay. Another thing is that we don't, we didn't at that time know how to compute multi year plans. Well, I suppose when I'm asking this question, I don't mean um, just the book itself. I mean the model as a whole, as as it's developed up until the present day. No, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty confident that the basic model is right. Uh, what we were trying to do was just take what Marx said in his later writings and see if you take that all that literally and take it seriously, what he's saying there, what does it imply? So that that was our starting point. Our starting point was what Marx wrote in Capital and what um, he wrote in the Critique of the Gotha Programme and saying, can we elaborate that? Oh, well, I have to say it is a very compelling uh, model. I said it as, as a very sceptical person who, who tries to be a realist. Even if people don't end up agreeing with it, um, I think that basically everybody who considers themselves a socialist should read it um, if only to react to it in some way, because I, I really do think it's an important work. It's marked by the particular conjuncture that we wrote it in. We were writing it in at the time of Perestroika, when it was clear that the existing model in the Soviet Union was being criticised and had weaknesses, and we wanted to intervene in that ideological con- conjuncture with a defence that is, in a sense, a, an orthodox Marxist defence, and, and being very orthodox in, in this, sorry, being very 
true to the original, if not necessarily what became the orthodoxy. Yeah, like classical Marxism. Yeah. Um, there's a question actually related to that. It's it's not quite the same, though I told you that I'm active in DM25 and we're trying to uh, figure out our own policy um, of post-capitalism in Europe. So let's say a socialist movement has come to power in Europe in 50 years and wants to implement towards a new socialism. What are, do you think are the most important and most likely ways that they would make a mess of that? Because there's always a problem of, of interpretation and implementation. Well, as I was saying before, I mean, it, the, the book is conjunctural. It was written almost 30 years ago. Who knows what the situation is going to be like in 50 years? I mean, it's, it's just unrealistic to, to, to think you can predict what the world situation is like in 50 years. How much of uh, Western Europe will be underwater? How much of um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Southern Europe will be uninhabitable due to wildfires? I mean, you just don't know. Oh, yeah, that's no, it's, it's fair. It's fair. I, I suppose, how, let me see how I would rephrase that. If you could speak to those people in 50 years, uh, not knowing what situation they're in, what warning would you give them in trying, if they were trying to implement this model? I think things you've got to make sure is that you don't attempt to make a switch too suddenly. You mustn't sw- switch from one system to another whilst taking away what you're standing on at the moment. So um, you've got to have a period in which the two systems run in, run to an extent in parallel. So you can, it's relatively easy to transform ownership relationships, relations. You can either make the entire economy state-owned, or you could make the entire economy cooperative-owned just by legislation. Um, To actually set up a system of of planning beyond that requires you to have software networks and data networks operating in place. Um, And you've got to do that step by step. You've got to start off by ensuring that you're collecting the data uh, whilst transactions are still taking place in monetary units. You can shift the, the, the basis of your currency to be time rather than arbitrary units of money to, to de-fetishize the relations of production. But uh, until you actually have got the data to, to coordinate it, you're still going to have to require enterprises to balance their books for a period until till you have the data and then you can shift to, to a non, um, I can't remember, I, I can't say the Russian word, Kozrakots or whatever they called it. Um, you know, you, you cease to have the, the things as being juridical subjects. The enterprises cease to be juridical subjects, but that uh, can only come once you have a, a degree of um, coordination. Now, in a sense, just nationalization is able to achieve that pretty rapidly in that when they nationalize the health service, the individual hospitals and things very rapidly cease to be juridical subjects. Um, and the same applies to when they na- Britain nationalised the, the the coal mines. The individual collieries cease to be juridical subjects. Uh, so it, some aspects of it can be carried out quite quickly, um, but the, 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 you don't want to make the mistake of thinking you can suddenly completely transit from one system to another. Um, overnight. But on the other hand, I don't think it need be a very long time. I don't think it need be more than about uh, five to 10 years. Quite a short time, really, in the scheme of things. I mean, that, that is, uh, have you ever read um, Langer's book? No. On socialism, where his, his reply to, to Hayek 
Well, basically, he 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 says any socialist government that doesn't proceed very rapidly with transforming the economy isn't really serious, and that it can be done. He 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 thought he was obviously a a, a state market socialist, um, and in a sense, what he was proposing was very similar to what the model that was put in pl place by the Attlee government um, for those sections it brought under control. And uh, the, basically, he was saying, if you put it off, you're not serious about it. I'll definitely um, check out that, that work of Lange. I'll be um, 78 in 50 years anyway. So uh, if I don't end up in some kind of uh, fascist prison camp, then I will definitely bear that in mind. Um, um, <laughs> uh, so uh, we do we do one one last question, or we do leave it. Okay, at that. one more. I really like this question. It's about a towards a new socialism research program. So imagine you were the director of a multidisciplinary team at a fully funded research institute whose purpose was to develop a vision for a democratic post capitalist society. Uh, what would be the outlines of your research program? what aspects of towards the new socialism would you like to flesh out? So I suppose this is continuing on from the weaknesses question, but. Well, the, the biggest thing is to develop the software for, on the one hand, na nationwide participatory budgeting and nationwide participatory democracy. And the other hand to, to develop robust planning software. It's one thing for me and one or two students to develop uh, participatory democracy software student projects. That There's a big difference between that and robust stuff that could be rolled out. On a more general point, what I would be getting people to, to investigate is trying to build parameterized Markov models of the conditions under which social change can occur. Uh, what do you think would be the practical use of that in transitioning to... Uh, for political strategy. Political strategy. So to understand what are the possibilities given certain concrete conditions? Yes. Yeah, yes. Because it would vary from country to country. It would, yeah. indeed. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. It's nice to imagine what would happen. I mean, obviously the social science uh, mainstream is neoclassical economics and all the uh, resources go there, which is essentially an exercise in futility. Uh, and I just think it's, it's interesting to imagine what would happen if we even put 1% of those resources towards <laughs> something that would actually yes. help us, you know? Yes, uh, yes, indeed. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So, we can leave it at that. It's been fantastic talking to you. There are still a lot more questions, so it's up to you. If you'd like to do uh, this again sometime, we could do that. Well, or... I mean, it, it, maybe in another couple of weeks. So thank you very much. Um, okay. Have a good rest of the evening and good weekend. Take care. Bye for now.